What's going on, everyone? This is David Green with my good buddy, James Daynard. Well, I say good buddy. I guess we're good buddies in the real estate space. We haven't actually met in real life. We should probably be clear about that. But I like you. You seem to know what you're doing. You seem to be a good guy. And I feel like we have a very similar avatar, right? Like if if this was Nintendo Wii, someone took my head and if they were like, nah, give him a little bit of hair. Like and they just plugged it right on top. That's kind of what you're looking like. And then if they like slimmed it down a little bit, like nah, make it a little bit more ripped, a little bit more cut. And then boom, you get James out of the David uh, thing. Did you ever think a thought like that? I, you know what, I was thinking that when I was in the shower this morning, which is a little bit creepy, but it's uh, yeah, I was I was thinking the same thing. You know, and, and we're like virtual BFFs. We run in the same spaces. That's a good point, right? Like yeah. we're walking around in the same metaverse, just different versions of the same avatar doing the same thing. So hopefully that makes this a fun episode. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your business if people haven't heard you on the podcast? Yeah. So uh, I'm a local real estate investor and broker out of Seattle, Washington. Uh, I've been working in the market for the uh, last 15 years, uh, got in the business knocking doors um, for an investment company in 2006, and then kind of scaled accordingly from there. Um, from starting our own brokerage. And then we lend hard money over in Seattle as well. And then we're very, very active value add investors in Washington. So we, you know, we buy the ones that nobody wants that are falling down and we rip them down to studs and rebuild them up and and get them back to market. And we just maximize them, maximize out the, the values. Can you explain when you say a value add investor? Like I've heard people talk about Warren Buffett in a similar fashion. He's a value investor. That's why he's not buying. What does that mean in in our world? So, you know, my definition of value add investor, there's, there's, you know, I think anything that you're buying on investment, you got to fix up and kind of stabilize a little bit. But value add is where you have to put in a, a substantial rehab plan or uh, to, to to bring it to that next level. You know, it's really, it's not about just buying a good deal. It's about buying the right deal and putting the right plan in play where you're, you really can take a shell of a property and maximize out the space. Uh, because, you know, you can, you can skin a cat so many different ways on each building or each house. And then we always go for highest and best. Doesn't matter how hard the construction process is going to be in the meantime. It's a, uh, we call it short-term pain, long-term gain. Like you got to deal with the painful year of getting it fixed up and then getting it mm-hmm. kind of to the maximum value. I want to ask you your opinion on the market we're in and how it affects the value of value add versus turnkey. I have some thoughts on that that I don't normally get to share. This would be a good place to do it. But before I do, why don't you let the, our audience know what you think you do best in the world of real estate investing? You know what I think I do best is, you know, underwriting and evaluating the, the the right strategic rehab plan is by far, I think, what, what I do best. I mean, those it's, you know, being in a brokerage, we sell typically about two to 300 investment properties a year to our clients. And the reason we can do that in a market that's so low on inventory, you know, Seattle's much like San Francisco, where it's got tons of tech uh, expansion, a lot of money in the market, it's very competitive. And so to be able to ninja out those deals, you got to be able to underwrite them and then put, you know, and look at things with a different pair of glasses. I call them deal goggles. Like you got to be able to put those deal goggles on to kind of see through what everyone else is missing and snagging out that deal that everyone else kind of overlooked. I love that. It's kind of like Neo when you're in the Matrix. I, I don't know if we're dating ourselves with that. I think the Matrix is still cool. Where when Neo's in the Matrix, he doesn't see a person in front of him. He sees green code. And because he can see past what's just being put in front of his face, he can see the underlying code behind the computer that he's dealing with. He can stay one step ahead of his competition. And I feel like that's what you're describing. If you can look at a house that someone else would be like, oh, I would never want to deal with that. And you can see the way to make money out of it. You have a pretty big advantage. It's funny. People, they'll call me up like, oh, you take all the good deals for yourself. I'm like, actually, we take the deals that nobody wants. You know, like uh, almost every property I've bought in the last year, they have not been like some exclusive off market rare thing that we bought. Yeah. Yep. It was that we saw potential in a property, whether it was, you know, location or lot size or different selling features of the property and saw the potential and then waited for the right time to strike on it as well. You know, a lot of the stuff that we, that we buy, it's sitting on market for months and months at that time. And, and, and people are looking at it the wrong, you know, or it could be mismarketed as well. Like, you know, they're advertised as a development site and everybody's looking at tearing this property down and building. Whereas I'm going, well, I'm going to do the complete opposite and keep this thing. Yeah. And so 
I like to do the opposite of what, uh, what everyone else is doing, because I think if everyone else wants to do it, that's where the margins get compressed. I want to go where it's hard and because there's less competition and the margins are a lot larger. You're creeping me out, man. I think exactly the same way. Yeah. Most things I've done in life was I was started buying in 2010 when everyone else was saying, don't buy. And then in 2015 or so, everyone was saying, hey, the market's going to crash. We've hit the peak. We got to get out now. And I was like, yeah, I just don't think so. I think that there's so much inflation that's coming and our country just keeps printing money that real estate's going to become more valuable. And so I started buying more. And then COVID came and people can go back and listen to the BP podcast. There was a lot of voices that were saying we're heading into a depression. The country's going to be run into the ground. Nobody's going to work. And I said, yeah, I don't think that's what's going to happen. I think we're going to have a run up in prices. And sure enough, that's what happened. And so every once in a while, I will see sort of a post on uh, one of my videos or on social media. And they're like, oh, this is bubble talk. This is a realtor telling you to buy real estate. Of course, that's what they're saying. God, I've been seeing that for so long. And the fundamentals still look strong. What's your opinion on sort of the underlying value of real estate? Is it overvalued? Does it still have room to go? And why do you feel that way? Wait, and that's, I think, a tricky question because I think, you know, right now, like we were saying, is they printed so much money and they stuck so much money in our market. I think everything's overvalued. And so it's just that's the inflation bringing everything up. And so mm-hmm. that's the magical question. Is it overvalued or is this just the new norm? And that's a great way to put it. It's and that's what we've been kind of struggling with. Like, well, do we double down and buy more now? And or do you wait and see if there's a correction and mm-hmm. it, you know, kind of circling back on Warren Buffett is, you know, he has that saying is, you know, and right now, the thing that kind of kind of pulls me back a little bit right now is everybody's buying. And he has that saying, you know, be be what is it? Uh, be afraid when fearful when others are greedy and yeah. greedy when others are fearful. Yeah. And that's like and so right now I'm like, well, my I and we've also bought a ton of properties and, and then we did the same thing in COVID when March hit, we bought. 12 homes in March and, and no one, and most of that was because our investors go, Hey, we don't want in this anymore. We want out. And so we stepped in and bought, and it was probably one of the best buys I buying sessions I ever had. Um, didn't know the market was going to go up 25%, but yep. it's, um, you know, it, I, I think right now you should be cautious because a lot of things point to unsettling, you know, I mean, there, when you dump that much money in, inflation happens, rates could rise, which that affects affordability dramatically in the market. You know, every point that goes up can affect 10 percent in affordability. And, you know, for us, it's just about put. you can buy in any market, just put the right plan on it. Mm-hmm. You know, there's low risk plans and high risk plans and there's there's short time frames and long time frames. And when you're in a riskier market, you want to keep your time frame short and then just make sure that you have additional exit plans for each property. And then that way you can kind of cover your basis. I think what makes inflation tricky when it comes to dealing with real estate is if if you really break down investors like you and I, when we're buying a property, what we're doing is very simple. We're establishing a baseline value for what that property should be worth based on what the market's saying, what an appraisal would be, what kind of income it generates, whatever type of property it has, has its own baseline that's set. We are then trying to find as low below that baseline as we can get in and then solve the problems that we incurred by going below what the property was worth. So it needs a rehab, it needs tenants kicked out, something like that. When inflation is occurring, that baseline moves. And that's what makes, I think that's what's making everybody lose their minds right now, right? Like the Joker, everybody's losing their minds. You don't know what it's worth. So like if it's worth 800,000 and it went up to 900,000, then we would say it's overvalued. But what if, 900,000 is actually worth what a million was worth when 800,000 was what we started at. Now it's actually undervalued. It's very difficult. And I think for the people that are on the sidelines and they're trying to figure out like, when do I jump into this game of double Dutch? That's what they need to understand is that that baseline that we all need to have to make decisions, like any decision you make, who are you going to marry? Well, you've got a baseline understanding of what you're looking for in a spouse or what a good human being is. And if somebody's beneath that, you're not going to marry them unless you think you've got a rehab plan to get them up to where they need to be, right? What's your thoughts on just like how that affects the psyche of the people that your brokerage is working with and the deals you're doing? Yeah, the unknown is always the terrifying thing, right? It's like, well, what, what could happen? And, you know, what we've done 
well, we always go back to our story. Like, you know, when we learned really how to flip houses or buy a lot of the value add, it was into the market was crashing and currently. Like we started a new company. We were trying to sell investment properties. Nobody would buy them because they're like, well, why would I buy if the market's sliding down 5% a month? And yeah. so, you know, instead of taking that and going, well, there's an opportunity in every market, right? Whether it's frothy or not frothy or it's, it's reclining or it's declining and you're trying to figure it out. So like back then, what we would do is we would buy a property, figure out the value and then take 10% off the value. We're like, all right, by the time we go to sell it, it's going to be worth 10%. Uh, you know, more in this heavy inflationary period, what we've been doing is really going, you know, for our rental, there's, you know, we, we do, we do development, rental property and fix and flip. So we have different plans for each one of our business sectors, but for, for rentals, we started targeting the ones that we go, okay, well, housing prices has gone crazy. It's gone through the roof. And, you know, a lot of the areas that have gone, that gotten the highest appreciation are actually your first time home buyer markets because of, Financing is so cheap, right? They're putting three and a half percent down. They're getting three percent rates, and so you're seeing this sudden appreciation in the small markets, but the rents have not caught up. And so what we've done is we've actually doubled down on buying rental properties in sub markets of Seattle rather than our core markets of you know the the core neighborhoods, which is usually our tech buyers. Um, and so we kind of switched where we were because we saw more potential there. We want to make sure that we have numerous different exit strategies. You know, you, we don't want to buy on FOMO where we're like, everybody's crushing it and we're not crushing it. We want to buy and, you know, because you don't want to miss, you don't want to miss the the mark, but you also don't want to be sitting out and all of a sudden the housing's all 15% higher next year. Yeah. And so you can buy in any market and that's why we like the value add because no matter what, our basis is still cheap at the end of the day. We're buying it well below replacement costs, and then we're stabilizing it. And so even if the market goes up or down, our margin's still there. Or like if you buy a Burr property and you refinance it, you still know you have that 15 to 20% equity position. So if the market goes down, you're okay. You know, just really lock in your financing right now. Well, you've also mentioned that replacement costs functions as a form of a baseline for you. So that's why you feel comfortable because you're like, well, it would cost this much to rebuild it if I'm buying it for less than that. While the value may be fluctuating up and down as far as what the market says it's worth, the replacement cost is an anchor that you understand. And I, that's one of the reasons I think you have confidence to move forward. Yeah, and I heard, I heard something the other day. It was like uh, that appraisers are now having to figure out because replacement cost has gone up so much within the inflationary. Because inflation has not only hit home prices, it's hit construction costs, cost to build their way up. They're 25% up from pre-pandemic. And so now appraisers are actually having to change how they evaluate their replacement cost theory. And so that's one of my rules of thumb is, well, right now what I like buying is if I'm buying it below replacement cost or if it's got a lot of heavy lifting. Um, and then also what we're doing is I like to buy properties that I know I can get long-term financing on because I am worried about interest rates in about five. You know, I mean, I think they're going to slowly tick up, but I don't know where they're going to be in five years. And if it, a lot of these commercial properties, if you can't get really long-term financing on it, that can dramatically change everything in five years. Um, and so I think in these times, everyone's going, well, the main pro thing you need to look for is housing market going to come down. That's actually, that's one piece. There's so many other things that you need to do as an investor to prepare for this inflationary period. You know, we, we went through and refinanced all of our commercial loans and staggered out all of our balloon payments for the next 10 years. So we're not going to get hit in five years with, you know, 500 units that need to be yeah. refinanced out. We're, you know, we're just taking the steps to, to make sure that it's not just about the now, it's about five years from now. Because inflation is really going to affect us down the road, not current currently. Right now, it's been helping us with pricing. I like that. The, the best investors don't look for an opportunity with no risk at all. They look for ways to mitigate risk, smooth out those really steep, like, you know, this could drop really hard, like what you just did. If you had 500 units that all needed to be refinanced at the same time, hey, that's a buttload of work that you got to go do to provide financials to banks to try to do it. And B, if you do have rising rates, you just got hammered by all of them. But if you've staggered them out over a period of time, if rates do go up, you've really mitigated how much that's going to hurt you. And maybe one out of those five complexes, let's say you have five 100 unit places, yeah. that that one goes up at the other four kind of cover for it. And then when rates drop, now you can refinance that one while the other four are still solid.
good. And it's that smoothing out of these big ups and downs, I think, that help people stay in real estate for the long term. And the long term is where you make money in this game. Yeah, it's about balancing how you're investing. And you know what I learned from the first big market correction, and I don't think that's going to happen now. But what I did learn is I was doing everything 100% the same way. Like it was like buy my single family house, refinance the most about I could out of it, and then go buy another house with that. But then what happened is I was stuck with a bunch of the similar types of assets that had heavier leverage on them that weren't cash flowing that well. And then the market went down and it put me in a bad spot. So, you know, as we look at our portfolio, anytime that, we're, you know, it's all about the forecasting. Again, don't act on the now, act on the the, the come. And, and so it's going, all right, well, if these things happen, let's say rates spike, what is that going to do to our monthly cash flow on our portfolio? Well, yes, it's going to hurt on this sector of housing, but on the these houses that are on 30-year rates, we're going to look really good on because we're, we're locked in at very cheap money on these. And so when you're looking at your rental portfolio, we look at it as a pie chart. How do we fill this pie chart up that can that can actually weather any type of market condition? And, mm. and maybe in in some markets like right now, there it's all going up. But you know, if if rates spike, we're okay because we have a sector that's on fixed thirty year loans. And then we, you know, uh, or you know, when I'm looking at doing my financing, what's in this piece of the pie? So maybe I'm going to choose this other option, even though it's more money because it's less risky in two years. Yeah. And I think we've also set our businesses up that way. So like I invest heavily in real estate and I also sell a lot of houses when the market's going up, it's easier to sell houses for the most part. So I'm prepared for when we do have a market crash and my real estate agent business or brokerage isn't making as much money. Well, I'll have capital stored away that I can go buy properties that are worth less. And then when those properties rise up, and, and there's less opportunity to buy, well, you'll make more money helping other investors with loans or with buying a property or flipping houses or whatever. I kind of look at it like the more tools you have in your belt, the less you worry about what the market does. Because there's always, you know, there's always a plus whenever you have a negative. There's always a pro whenever you have a con. It's when you get stuck into, this is my only method of making money in real estate. And then the market shifts, somebody moves your cheese, you don't know where to go to get fed. Yeah, and that's, I think that's, yeah, it's it's how do you set up your income streams to where one of the rivers can be running a little dry, but you're good. And, and it just goes in, you know, say, I, I do the same thing with my passive investments because I have been, you know, I'm, I'm more of an operator where I get my hands dirty all the time, uh, get myself involved, but I've been trying to do a little bit more passive. And so what I've done, though, is I didn't, you know, I've taken this, this set amount of capital and I've because I don't know what's going to happen in the next two years, I put some in hard money loans. So I'm getting short term six month loans. So I know it comes back in six months. I do some JV deals that will be a 12 month term. And then I have some in some syndication or some other investments that are going to be, you know, five years plus. And so what it does, though, it keeps track of my liquidity on my long, my my passive income to where, OK, if the market goes to hell in a handbag. Then the syndication stuff that I'm in, that might not do that well, but then I still have my capital coming back on these other two things in the short term to keep my reserves up. Because if something goes wrong, you just want to make sure that you can weather the storm. The storm will always blow through. And honestly, if you can weather the storm, that's when a lot of people jump out too. And that's when you double down, you know, buy when people are freaked out. That's a great point. Like if you sort of, I've always looked at it like the rock, paper, scissors analogy. And I noticed that there's a lot of things in life that work this way. There, if there is no best way. Rock is it better than paper or scissors. It's which one of them is being presented to you is the one that you want to have. So real estate is going to change. Uh, economic opportunities are going to change. The tax code is going to change. The rules that we play by are constantly changing as life changes. You sort of want to be aware of what's happening and then try to anticipate where it's going to go, but have a backup plan in place, like you said, to weather the storm. So that's something I really hope anyone listening to this takes out of it. If you're waiting to say, I only want to sail in blue skies, you will never get out there because at some point you could have a storm that will come. And so you're never going to go take a trip on a boat because you don't, you can't control that. But if you got a plan in place, when the storm goes, this is where we're going to anchor and we have enough supplies to keep us alive for this much time. And so then when the storm ends, we're going to go out there and we're going to be the first boat out there. That is what really successful business owners and investors, that's how they think. They don't run away from risk. In fact, sometimes, like you said, I like risk. I like to see risk. I like to see where other people are going to back out and have a fire sale. Or they're going to say, I wasn't prepared for this. Um, I, I, I don't know how 
I've been banging that drum for a while here, so I'll probably let that go. But it's very important that anybody who wants to build a portfolio just makes peace with that fact because nothing in life works without risk. Even your W-2 job that feels safe and secure, you can get in a car accident on the way there. It's not without risk. And so you just you can't try to run away from that your whole life. And I, I think you're doing a very good job, James, of how you've sort of like diversified your income streams in all these different ways. So no matter which way the market goes, you've got a plan in place to win. Yeah. I mean, who knows? I, 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 I did not live throughout the seventies and eighties, you know, I was, I was pretty young in the eighties, but uh, you know, one thing that I've been doing is reading what happened in the eighties after hyperinflation in the seventies and you know, what did real estate do? What did the markets do? And then, but we also have to look at what was going on during the economy too. Our economy is much more robust now. Than it was yeah. in the 80s. You know, yep. we are the superpower in the economy. Well, there was a time when interest rates on housing was between 18 and 22 percent, and people were still buying houses, right? And they didn't yeah. stay at 18 to 22 percent forever. So if rates do go up, yeah, that could affect home prices, but are they going to stay really high? And if it does affect home prices, what if we've had so much inflation that even though prices drop, they're still higher than they are today when they drop? That's another thing to think about. So you know, I'll share one of the ways that I'm zigging when everyone zags, that I'm being greedy when they're fearful, isn't just buy or not buy. It's the type of properties I'm buying. So one of the mistakes that I see investors make is that when we get to what we feel is the top, because no one ever knows when you're actually at the top, right? Last time we had an idea that some of the fundamentals were weak because of the lending. But in general, you don't know what's going to happen that will make prices crash. Like no one saw COVID-19 coming is they say, well, prices are high, so I want to buy the cheapest property I can to mitigate my risk. And they go into the worst neighborhoods and they end up with the the worst tenant base and the worst problems and the worst properties because they think that they're safe. Well, when the market does drop, those properties get hit way harder than the ones in the nicest neighborhoods. And that's something that I saw the last time. The, the best neighborhoods out in the Bay Area where I'm living, like the Walnut Creek and Orinda and the nicest areas in San Francisco, they just kind of had a dip. It was a little bit of a slowdown. It wasn't a crash. But the worst properties, the areas that were furthest away from where the economic drivers were, they got hammered. I mean, they went down to like a third of what their price was. And so when the market is near the peak or close to it, or at least whatever you want to call it, we think we're near the top. I tend to buy in only the best areas and only the best properties. It is actually safer, even if it costs more money. Would you have any advice on the Seattle area specifically with areas where you're kind of telling your investors, here's where you're better off buying in a market like this? Good areas stay, you know, people with money have money and in those areas they flow. Um, they, you know, the, my favorite neighbors to invest in right now are Bellevue, Washington. Uh, we, we like Bellevue a lot, or we like the east side, which is Bellevue, Kirkland, Redmond. Uh, the reason being is one thing I have, though, it, it's it, you have the economies there. It's close to all the high paying tech jobs in, in that. I always like to be around a good baseline in economy because not only do the kind of less desirable neighborhoods slip, the other like the entertainment city slip. Where there's not, you know, you look at Vegas, San Diego, where there's not a lot of really core, core, core business there. A lot of it's that hospitality, vacation, life, travel, travel, yeah. those places I try to stay clear from. So I like to be around where the jobs are. Uh, we've been tracking where everything's getting expanded. So in the east side, um, Google, the big tech companies are expanded rapidly. The other reason we like it is because of the pandemic, people have gotten a very big appreciation for lot size and being space. And so one thing I, I kind of tracked down was that homes on bigger lots were appreciating at 28% year over year, rather in Bellevue, they were at 10%. So that's almost three times the appreciation on these specific types of lots. And so, you know, so as we've been looking at buying, we're trying to stay in the core areas where the high demand is, because no matter what, if there was appreciating three times as fast, those are going to hold a lot better uh, down the road. And and we just like that the, the, uh, we've, we've also tracked where all the business growth is. So we know that even if we go into a recession, there's still jobs available there. And, you know, like when you when you have these tech companies building out around you, these are and, yeah. and their plans are five and 10 year build outs. So by the time they're done building out, we should be through whatever we were going through anyways. And it's all upside at that point. And so, yeah, east side, we like core areas. We like the more residential neighborhoods in Seattle, Ballard, Queen Anne, 
uh, where people can feel good, that they can kind of move around. Um, and then the other area outside Seattle is Tacoma, uh, the mm-hmm. kind of the southern city uh, in the Hilltop neighborhood, which has been a massive transformation. And that's really driven to not only because people it's affordable and people like the kind of vibe in the city and the, the movement, it also has a, um, the sound transit. So that long commute has has gone been cut in half. All right. Well, thank you very much, James. This has been a great time. I appreciate you uh, you staying here with us. If you guys want to hear more of James, check him out on the Bigger Pockets podcast, episode three thirty eight, as well as five five zero, where he shares more details on how he runs his business. Anything you want to say before we get out of here? No. Or if uh, you you want more information on what we do, you can check me out on my Instagram handle, J Dane Flips. Uh, we do a lot of construction overview, uh, kind of in the trenches walkthroughs on our social media. Uh, you get to see all the headaches I'm dealing with on a daily basis uh, or check out our company website at www.heatandaner.com. All right. You could find me at davidgreen24.com or davidgreen24 on social media. Thanks very much, James. Have a good one. 